Today we're going to be asking the question, is Master Chief a hero or a monster? In order to decide this, I'm going to be looking at Halo Fall of Reach, a graphic novel. This is because it's an effective way at both visually depicting his heroism and monstrosity, as well as in writing. Halo Fall of Reach is Brian Reed's military science fiction adaptation of the popular Halo novel The Fall of Reach by Eric Nyland. The story serves as a prequel to the events of the first Halo game, Halo Combat Evolved. So we are somewhere in the 26th century before The Fall of Reach. In the story we follow the character of John, a child who is chosen for a super soldier program, the Spartan program, a program headed by Dr. Catherine Halsey. The program is necessary to deter the oncoming invasion of an alien species known as the Covenant. However, everything about the program is off the records and more than likely illegal. John is kidnapped at about the age of six, replaced by a Flash clone, a clone with a short lifespan that will die soon after its deployment. Under Oni's control, John is raised in harsh conditions and groomed by them to be the perfect soldier. Out of the chosen children for the program, John is the 117th, a number that is given to him which somewhat replaces his name. The series happens primarily on Reach, but does also include other ships and planets. Loneliness, duty, loyalty, and sacrifice are key themes for Halo and more so Halo Fall of Reach. For the purpose of defining Master Chief as either a hero or monster, I will specifically be looking at Halo Fall of Reach's bootcamp issues 1-4. to The battle for the planet Reach is the futuristic equivalent of the Greco-Persian Battle of Thermopylae, where 300 Lacedaemonians had a mountain pass in Thermopylae. This was in order to stall the incredibly large Persian army that was on its way to wipe out the currently planless Greeks. The sacrifice of the 300 allowed a strategy to be formed with the days they bought, resulting in the Greek victory at the Battle of Salamis. Similar to our Spartan super soldiers stalling the Covenant at Reach, with obvious ties of them sharing the name Spartan. When referring to how I categorise a monster, I will be using Jeffrey Cohen's Monster Culture Theses, and for the superhero, Peter Coogan's The Definition of the Superhero. I want to briefly introduce the idea of the superhuman transformation, likely one of the most famous being that of Captain America, who introduced the idea of a human who had been physically enhanced by science, allowing for miraculous strength and speed and to be impervious to harm, and it was all to benefit mankind. Like Captain America, John is put through his transformation with the justification of it being a dire wartime like Cap with World War II and John with the Covenant. This here applies the first of Jeffrey Cohen's theories. Monsters born of political expedience and self-justification nationalism function as living invitations to action, usually military. Something I found interesting about this page once I had read it was these particular lines that a scientist says. It reminded me instantly of Frankenstein and the creation of a monster, the two being very contradictory supposedly opposite ends of the spectrum, yet met with such similar reactions. So I thought this would be an important setup to the idea of creating both a hero and monster through scientific enhancement and transformation, and how noticeably similar they are when portrayed in the comic form. Establishing the idea of the two precise laws of nature being gleefully violated, as Cohen J puts it, and how this results in a certain form of consequence. The centre stage is usually given to the hero or the monster, despite the breaking of natural laws being an endeavour by the scientist. The splash panel to the left is an amazing depiction and encapsulation and unsurety of Dr. Halsey in regards to the Spartan program. First of all, she is absent from the panel, which really tells us more than if she were there. The slow fall of speech balloons coming from the tablet, which states that lots of children won't survive the superhuman transformation, which makes the room feel emptier as they are the central focus of what fills it, the speech balloons, that is. Drawing our focus from the top left to the bottom right while remaining central makes certain our eyes are always confined, making the empty panel seem emptier. It's equally visualised through the uncertain ambience of the room, created with contrasting light and dark, particularly the window which allows a singular beam to enter, a hopeful one. It's particularly powerful using a singular splash panel to what could instead be a conversation spanning many, 
It shortens and condenses the emotion so it can all be taken at once. To the right, John's transformation is depicted in a particularly visually vivacious way, with its contrasts of colour between panels interluding from blood red to an almost uh, heavenly or angelic glow. The restriction of the blood coloured panels interluding with the angelic ones that reach the page's edge allow for the pain visually contained within the blood panels to feel crushed and constricted. It shows a visual pressure with use of the negative space, which helps with the closure we have to use to fully understand the time frame in which this is happening. The angelic light is also a nice visual cue that shows us these experiments have the chance to put them a step closer to heaven. These experiments highlight Cohen J's third thesis. The monster's very existence is a rebuke to boundary and enclosure, and the laws of nature as set forth by science are gleefully violated. They call horrid attention to the borders that cannot must not be crossed, depicted by the horrible pain shown and the visual excess of blood through the transformation. These two differing accounts are important as it shows us that these heroes, being created to save humanity, are to not only be altered physically but mentally too, receiving a marred view of history to compel their minds. It's a fantasy scenario of a perfect outcome, a war where our heroes survive and the day is saved. King Leonidas died in the midst of battle, not even at the final stand along with the other Spartans. In this way, history itself becomes a monster, defeaturing, self-deconstructive, always in danger of exposing the suchers that bind its disparate elements. The colours here are also interesting, with the artist opting for an almost sickly plague green, compared to the usual warming blue of the other AI and simulations. Possibly simply to show that we are viewing past events, but also to tie into the fact that these children are being shown a false representation of war. Their minds are being infected with this idea of false heroism. Unlike the ancient Spartans, who Herodotus comet could name every single one of them, our Spartan soldiers will not be remembered, emphasised with their shadowed look over their ancient counterparts. They are faceless, unlike the Spartans, their silhouettes hanging over the globe ghostily. They'll fight as heroes, but die as these faceless monsters misremembered like the ancient Spartans. It's the AI here that is in the calming blue, another architect controlling the children's perception, so the colour is important here. Another thing to note here is the was that the ancient Spartans were also volunteering and not stolen as children to fight. The ancient Spartans fought for their own honour and the livelihood of their country and race. These augmented super soldier Spartans fight for their creator, who has put them under circumstances of pain and hate in order to make them cohere to their own needs. In this panel, we as the reader are set behind the gun, almost like we are holding it, firing into the large group of men ahead, an almost amorphous horde of military green, paired with the gunfire that sweeps across the panel, disregarding the boundary of its borders until it flies entirely off the page in mid brack suggesting not only that this is ongoing, but fills the space as it descends across even the negative space. Due to this graphic novel being based off of a video game, the action is specifically depicted reminiscent of the gameplay, which I won't get into, but it is important for the purpose of our inclusion within it. In this particular panel, it shows us the idea of utilising John as a means of safe expression for acts of violence, through the body of the monster, fantasies of aggression, Domination and inversion are allowed safe expression in a clearly delimited and permanently liminal space, Cohen J. Which, similar to how the graphic novel portrays this, is arguably the entire point of video games, and more appropriately the comics and graphic novels that, that come from them, which allows this liminal space of expression unavailable anywhere else. And furthermore, it is shown here in this panel as it visually places us as the reader behind the weapon, aiming down its scope. It's allowing us in this moment to connect with the monster as a means of escaping um, to this liminal space to partake in acts of violence. In the midst of this slaughter, it raises the idea of the exploration of the relationship between power and the obligation to use it correctly. As we bear witness to our supposed heroes gunning down other humans, John and the Spartans take on an attitude to utilising power differently to, say, Spider-Man, as the context they are placed in is more dire, and they've reached this point through such actions. Here the heroic act is being manipulated, the killing of insurrectionist forces by John and co, as they are presented as almost monstrous, making it justifiable and depicted as heroic, when in fact it may be more monstrous, representing an anterior culture as monstrous, 
justifies its displacement or extermination by rendering the act heroic. Due to the transformation that John goes through and the high number of friends he has seen die, he begins to have nightmares. Negative space is utilised here to help relay to us that we are viewing a dream by squashing John into a tighter panel that adheres to a frame. From this we can infer ideas such as John feels a greater freedom in his dreams than he does his own life, another thing that is visually depicted through the light and dark contrast of desert to dark room. Dreams are also one of the only times we see a good portion of his face and the removal of those around him. This is not only daunting as we are aware of John to be the last Spartan, but also because of this disconnect he already seems to feel toward his friends and other Spartans. He is faceless when awake, and they are faceless when he is asleep. The cold colouring of these panels show us the physical torture the child's subjects went through shows us a clear drab mood of its environment. The first panel is at a disturbed angle, with clear creation of power having the soldier exceed both its border and the page whilst John is crippled into its confines. Notice also how the foot of the soldier breaks the panel confines once again in the second panel, as it looms over the top of John in the third, almost like he is visibly crushing him beneath his foot. Dr. Halsey is shadowed out perhaps representing John's ignorance to her intent. It certainly shows a division on the page in a way that the artist is trying to detract attention by shadowing her. However, in a way it actually draws your eyes more so. She is almost like a black hole on the page. The lighter and more mellow colours contrast directly to her presence, where before she blended with them, her pink dress matching the lighter colours and background of the second panel where she takes control. The colours remind the reader of spring and Easter, and they incite the idea of life. It immerses you into a malicious intent. We see an approachable and likeable woman, yet she is seeking these children for the purposes of forming them into lifeless soldiers. She is the dehumanised, faceless one. She is part of this evil that John will soon become. She is soulless like the soldiers she creates. Her supposedly friendly presence is reinforced by the way the angles and heights play on the page. Every panel has John and Halsey on the same level, same height, stature, likely to show an equality between the two. She quite literally comes down to John's lower level, lower stature in these panels to relate to him. Even when she stands in the final panel, the perspectives are made to show her still very much at the same level. The coin almost feels symbolic of John's enslavement in this moment. He's been bought off by a singular coin, for a life that consists of endless fighting. His ignorance to this fact is not only heartbreaking, but shows that, although John may become a killing machine, he is not the hero nor is he the villain. He is a misguided child under the chains of the true monstrous villain that is Dr. Halsey. However, much like Captain America, he is chosen because of the person he is, rather than the destruction he is capable of. This is contradictory, however, as they seemingly tear away his personality until there is little left. This makes it questionable to John's superhero identity as much like Luke Cage, such a character could operate a detective security agency within a science fiction and not be considered a superhero. It's arguably the transformation that makes him the superhero. Prior, he is simply a hero. Put simply, John is an inhuman creation for the purpose of repelling an inhuman invasion. You'll notice in these panels immediately the striking, contrasting images of our hero opening fire onto some soldiers and how they're Humanity is lacking compared to those who they kill, based off of their attire and mechanical armour and numbered suits. I included a comparison of the stormtroopers assaulting the rebels in A New Hope, for the purpose of showing them as the monster. Not only do these panels reflect this scene clearly, but they establish the higher connection that John and the Spartans have to the stormtroopers, the most well-known use of dehumanisation through a mask in science fiction. It uses this classical scene to show us that maybe here we aren't looking at heroes. The purpose of these suits aside side protection are to incite this fear that dehumanisation through masks and suits create. The monster's body quite literally incorporates fear. It explicitly furthers their painting as monsters by having them aim at the reader and then showing the dying humans almost as if we are the ones being gunned down. Once again, the colouring is utilised to show the drab soullessness of the Spartan and the painful death of the human troops. John is both attributed with the heroic identity through being named Master Chief, whilst also the dehumanising and inhumane numbering with 117. Arguably, 117 is a chevron, 
but not at the point during issues 1 to 4 of Boot Camp. The thing that steps John up to being a superhero is the deaths of his peers, the other Spartans, until it is only him left. The numbering across their chests is particularly visually striking, as despite the power they impose, here it imprisons them somewhat, reminding us of their beginnings, numbering being used throughout history to dehumanise and make monsters of such as Nazi concentration camps tattooing numbers onto their prisoners. It's the idea of lessening someone, numbering them like a farmer might mark a flock of sheep. Throughout the graphic novel, John is guised in a shadow, blacked out from the world, forgotten and unseen. By segregating him in this shadowed state, it separates him visually on the page, the singular shadowed colour tone depicting the perception others have of him. He's this blank and soulless suit of armour. It paints him as an outsider, very similar to the depiction of Moloch in Before Watchmen Moloch. Watch that video. Removal of John's facial features is dehumanising. Dehumanisation through tearing down their humanity and exclusive human features. Tearing him of his visual humanity his facial features, showing him as an empty shell created for a warring purpose. Whilst without the suit making him faceless, he is still faceless without it on, retaining his monstrosity. Shadows, obscured glimpses, signifies of monstrous passing that stand in for the monstrous body itself. Theses 2, Cohen J. In a way, John presents a very real subjective, potentially even objective fear which is loss of humanity and face, where so much of our visual identity appears and relies. So John is the monster here, he mirrors our subjective fear in a glass darkly, almost literally. To an extent this can be further by applying Nietzsche's famous quote, beware that, when fighting monsters, you yourself do not become a monster, for when you gaze into the abyss, the abyss gazes also into you saying we as readers, as onlookers to John's story, as this faceless soldier, as we experience the events he does and peer into his monstrosity, we in a way have shared it and retained it. We are forever staring into the abyss that is his mask or face. This is another lesson they learn from the AI, about, most basically, teamwork. By comparing the children to animals as well as the enemy, they dehumanise the people they injure and kill, whilst also numbing the children to think that they are worth the same fate. This is done cleverly as each panel mirrors and reflects, having the side-by-side -side comparisons as the events are explained integrate into our mind that these children are animals, and those they fight are too. There are role reversals happening live within the page. The man stalks John like the wolves stalk the deer, but we find it's a trap, and the man is in fact the deer, and John and the children are the wolves. It allows allows for the story to be told visually, without words, it still makes sense. In terms of dehumanising and making the children and their opposition monsters, it's done through visuals. The children are made to be animalistic, which lowers them. It's trying to show us that through the depictions of both sides being animals, that war is generally a horrible thing, and both sides harbour monsters. By animalising and dehumanising the children, it further makes them disposable, or in our eyes, it makes their lives drop in value, as they are subconsciously no longer human. When John receives his suit of armour, he effectively achieves his full superhero status at this point, the heroic codename and the costume alongside his connection of name to inner character or biography, which is 117, referring to his number in the Super Soldier program, a number which clings to him more so than his real name, somewhat becoming a chevron. The colour of John's armour is important because it depicts his military purpose, greens and golds. Colour plays an important role in the iconicity of the superhero costume. It retains him and controls him, not as a free entity, but a biological weapon of Oni, that is quite literally chained into their servitude, something that is depicted quite explicitly in the panels here. It's more than this, however, as the cracked helmet is very representative of a theme that is sacrifice. By John stepping into this armour, he is chained into fate, into a sacrificial state where his end is death and nothing else like all those that have died around him. This single image depicts John as a tragic hero somewhat. He is a hero for his actions in saving humanity and his perseverance, but a monster for the shell of what remains of him, and acting in the servitude of those who created him. In the end, he isn't 
definable as either a hero or a monster. This image is a true representation of these Spartan soldiers and the idea of sacrifice, especially of their own lives. Finally, this brings into question Cohen J's seventh thesis. These monsters ask us how we perceive the world, and how we have misrepresented what we have attempted to place. They ask us to reevaluate our cultural assumptions about race, gender, sexuality, our perception of difference, our tolerance toward its expression. They ask us why we have created them. Which begs the question of why John was created. An inhuman weapon for an inhuman war? To test the capability of the possible transformation of the human body? Mostly it asks the value of war. How it affects the people it creates. How it dehumanizes and twists us heroes or monsters, the line is never clear. Wars are messy and reside in a liminal way. John as the monstrous hero defines this liminality. He becomes it through his embodiment of both the hero and the monster. The constant struggle between the good and the bad when neither are correct. It effectively asks it about the Battle of Thermopylae itself, but with use of fictionalization and visualization in the graphic form, it allows us to rationalize and understand the reasons for and against it. I want to thank you all for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. I hope you can see I've put a lot of uh, work into this video, so if you did enjoy it, please leave a like, as well as a comment. I would be incredibly interested in what you will have to say. Thank you, and goodbye.